All right, 2016, it appeared that the alt-right uh, was on the bridge of a breakthrough, that it could become a significant political force in America and maybe even beyond America. Uh, well, it's going to be 2019 in a few days, and uh, that dream is dead. So now, as we stand, the alt-right looks dead. But uh, white identity is not dead. White identity will only grow. And the dissident right, I think, is, is very much alive. The title alt-right is dead. But uh, the dissident right is the primary audience. So I don't think I, I said that uh, the alt-right is my primary audience. I would say the dissident right is my primary audience means people who are right of center, who believe in hierarchy and who do not uh, primarily identify with conservatism. So they're looking for, for a, a right wing alternative to conservatism. I sometimes think that it's possible, and we're talking about Richard Spencer so much, um, that you may be keeping him alive, if only in a, a comic way that, you know, years from now, people will say, what, are you telling me that Richard Spencer was a real person? I thought that he was just that gag on Luke Ford's show. Rodney? Um, just, you know, as far as the obituary of the alt-right, I think that Kevin is spot on. I think that they were on the rise in 2016. I think they did so by riding Trump's coattails. I think inference that the alt-right elected Trump is wishful thinking. What got Trump elected was the 70,000 votes in three states in the Rust Belt. Uh, but I think that they rode those coattails, which is nothing wrong. I think that is masterful politics to ride a populist uh, coattails and then to build off of it. I think what you yeah. say about Trump is absolutely true. You know what uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said about hitching your wagon to a star, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, see, that worked, but you know, one, one gets the impression that certain people in the alt-right became envious of Trump. Oh, th he thinks he's all that. He well, thinks he's so Trump great. He'd be nothing without us. Kevin, they thought that Trump worked for them when it was quite the opposite. They needed Trump. Trump did not need them. They grossly overestimated their importance in the political spectrum. Sure. But I think that the alt-right uh, support, the memes and all that on Twitter, I think that was helpful to Trump. Well, sure. It kept a, a portion of his base energized and participating. I'm sure I, I don't discount that. But I think that their claims that they elected him were farcical and nonsensical. No, obviously. Obviously. Yeah. I have a large part of my personality that, that likes extremists. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Just, just as I, I read on the porn industry for 12 years, I, I find much of what the alt-right has said and done over the past four years just exciting. Uh, exciting stupid, exciting good, exciting bad, whatever. I just uh, There's just part of me that enjoys talking oh, to on. extremists. Come on, look, you know, every, if you see somebody, you know, if you see a pay-per-view event and one of it is, you know, uh, picking flowers, the other one is telecasting a suicide, everybody's going to watch the suicide, and that's what the alt-right has been for the last year and a half, literally people blowing their brains out politically. Yeah, but you see, uh, the, the Tea Party, the Tea Party was a reliable hate figure in America for a few years. You just never heard the end of the Tea Party, and then when? 2014, 2015, you just, you didn't hear about the Tea Party. The Tea Party was uh, suborned by the uh, Republicans, by, yeah. you know, the by uh, GOPE or Paycheck Conservatism, well, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and they were, uh, they were the most powerful, the most influential when they had no leadership. Right. Um, I think it would be instructive to examine the rise of Hitler and the mechanics of that rise. What you had was an individual who had a value add proposition for the elites of his society. He could say to them, a socialist revolution is inevitable. Every thinking man believes that socialism is the future. Well, I can offer you a national socialism, which is not going to uh, throw you to the gulag, which is not going to execute you, but which is going to be orderly, nationalistic, in many ways, a continuation of what came before, a return to what was there before. Um, moreover, when the time came, he stabbed his, um, his, what do you call him? His ideologues in the back 
and be became essentially conservative. He, he was willing to preserve the institutions of his country. He was willing to, uh, and, and there were people who believed in national socialism as uh, really as, as a revolution, and he killed them. He, he, he marginalized them, he killed them. He uh, solidly turned towards uh, keeping the Wehrmacht and, and not replacing it with the SA. Basically, he, he, he sided with the incumbents in the end, and that's what's in the end solidified his rise, right? You have someone who ultimately all told was a right-wing success story within his own country, a right-wing success story who again and again was able to offer a value proposition to the incumbents. The left can rise without providing a value proposition to the incumbents. I propose to you that the right can never rise without proposing a value proposition to the incumbents because the essence of the right must be a value proposition to the incumbents. From the very beginning, from the first left and the first right in the French Revolution or in the pre prelude to the French Revolution, the right was the side of the establishment, the side of order. If you try to be right wing, but also be proposing a revolution that sweeps away everything that comes before it, right? You are doomed. It's an oxymoron. It doesn't work. I'd have yeah. to dis I'd have to disagree for this reason, that the right originally identified, uh, and again, I'm going to cast this in uh, the terms of Burnham and Francis, because that's the vocabulary I speak, that the right was associated uh, with the uh, monarchy thrown an altar, and then it became associated with the uh, bourgeoisie. But it cannot become associated with the managerial state, which replaced the, the bourgeoisie. It's impossible. It could never happen. There is nothing to offer the managerialists because they have everything. They have everything and they are subsuming things into their control, which no one could even have imagined could be done. That, you know, everything inside the management and nothing outside it. So, I mean, the right has to, has to develop a, an alternative elite. Ann Coulter can laugh. She can mock Trump for, for appointing people that come from Goldman Sachs. Where does she think these people are going to come from? Where is the alternative? Where are the alternative companies, the alternative institutions that Trump can find people who can run departments? The, the new elite, the new capitalist elite, has vastly less power than the old aristocracy. And they feel that lack of power whenever they try to walk into a bar and pick up a girl. So there is, there is an issue with the system that the global capitalist class could have fixed if someone were to offer to fix it for them. Um, moreover, I would say that um, the, they, there is a threat to this gl uh, global capitalist elite from the collapse of institutions like uh, and, and, and from, from the collapse of, of respect for property, right? You, you, you could tell these people, right, if you bring in people from the third world, they will vote for third world policies, and that will not be the best for the security of your finances, and don't you deserve the best? That's the take, that, that's the, the way that I would try to sell it to them. Uh, and I think that that has a, a, a pretty good chance of succeeding, at least with some of them. The Silicon Valley elite is rootless and has lo no loyalty to any community, any state, any nation. Its money is international. As far as women go, they simply buy them. They buy them by the cartload. If these Silicon Valley types had any fear of what the United States government could do to them, they wouldn't have engaged in relentless denunciations of the president of the United States for two years worse than Hitler, a threat to this, that, and the other, a disaster unparalleled in American history. They are not afraid. And when I said buying women, I meant quite literally. That is to say, putting them on salary. Because you see, the advantage of putting uh, people on salary is then they become utterly dependent on you. As for children, you can get children from all manner of sources now. You can say that it comes from a, a particular woman, but who knows? And you can set it up legally that this child belongs to you and your erstwhile wife or partner uh, has nothing to do with it. The, the rich people now have powers that were unimaginable in earlier ages. 
Uh, Kyle, do you have a rejoinder to what Ke Kevin was saying? The the deep state and and and, and their ilk. They are they are genuinely afraid of 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 the United States turning on them. They just don't see Trump as being the avatar of that energy because he can't he can't wield that power when the deep state opposes him. He probably has two years left. They aren't afraid of him in the least. They're afraid of what comes after him. They're afraid of, of what's behind him, harrying his every step. 